My book is a little bit difficult to give a quick synopsis of because the content is expansive. I start in a pre-Adamic context and I go all the way to Armageddon and I cover a lot of things in between. So, you know, each different topic that I, that I deal with in the book is, is you know, a three hour discussion. So it's, it's kind of difficult, as I said, to give a quick synopsis, but the book is called Birthright. The Coming Post-Human Apocalypse and the Usurpation of Adam's Dominion on Planet Earth. And so um, I begin by describing, theologically speaking, what it means to be a human being. What was the, what was the context in which mankind was created and, and what does it mean to be human? We ask later on in the book, is our humanity worth preserving? So before we can get to the question, is our humanity worth preserving? We have to deal with the question, what does it mean to be a human being? What was the purpose of man and of mankind at large? And so that's that's where I begin. And this concept of the birthright is it's I sort of I sort of play on the the Jacob and Esau story with the birthright uh, that was that Esau sold for a bowl of stew to Jacob. And I believe that um, the birthright of mankind is dominion of the earth, that, that God gave Adam, when he created him, he gave him dominion of the earth. He bequeathed him with the authority of a, of a vice regent on planet earth, and indeed deeded him the earth to govern, to rule. And that that governance is dependent on our being human. In other words, the birthright of mankind is, is directly associated with his genome, with the genome of Adam. And that authority is passed down through from one generation to the next, because it is intimately associated with the image in which we were created. And that's a very long discussion. So I guess I'll just go ahead and pause here and we can go any, anywhere you want from there. Yeah. Can you explain? I love what you said at BlurryCon about the image and the ring of the king and that impression, almost like an embossing. Okay. That image of God. So the image of God is, it's a theological question that, as I, as I put in my book, the way I put it in my book is that it, 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 has, the, it, it has the consistency of pudding in the hands of theologians, there's nothing, no one ever wants to say definitive, definitively what it is, right? because it doesn't make any sense. The, the, I would say that the, the normative theological position in regard to the image of God is that, number one, human beings are the exclusive creatures that bear this image of God, the Imago Dei, and that the image of God is somehow referencing attributes that are unique to the human species. Most pastors will cite the proclivity the, for uh, creativity that human beings display, our, our ability to think rationally, our capacity for rational thought, um, our emotional complexity and, and, and other such things. But that never made any sense to me because it's obviously not true. And the reason why the image of God, A, can't be exclusive to mankind, and B, can't, be, can't really be demarcated by those attributes is because we're not the only ones in the story. We're not the only species who display these attributes because the Bible talks about, and I will use the word species, the Bible talks about another species that pre-exist mankind. They're called the sons of God, sometimes referred to as the morning stars. Sons of God, benai Elohim. And we know according to Job, which is the, is the most ancient text in the biblical canon, that the sons of God shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were laying. 
In other words, when the earth was created, the sons of these sons of God, whoever they are, these sentient beings, shouted for joy. So we know, therefore, that the sons of God pre-exist mankind. They pre-exist Adam and Eve. They pre-existed Adam and Eve. And so if these sentient beings existed in the cosmos before us, they're shouting for joy. They're clearly very intelligent beings because we encounter them, we encounter them throughout the biblical narrative uh, with the ambiguous designation of angel. And of course, angel, angel simply means a messenger, an envoy, one who is sent, malak in the Hebrew and angelos in the Greek, not even used, not even used exclusively of human beings within the biblical narrative. Um, however, the term sons of God is used exclusively of heavenly beings in the Old Testament. Uh, these beings, angels, these celestial, these heavenly beings display all of these attributes that, that most pastor th pastors think are exclusive to mankind um, and, 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 and which they associate with the image of God. So the angels of heaven are clearly very creative. They sing and, and, and play music. They have a written language. They, they write and keep records. They have a, um, they eat and drink. They use and assumedly build technology. Um, they display all of the hallmarks of a civilization, an advanced civilization. In fact, more advanced than our civilization. And there's many reasons that 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 we that we are entitled to to conclude that this is an ancient, advanced civilization. And so, what differentiates the human species, the human race, from the angelic race, who I designate, I, I denominate in my book, the elder race, simply because the angel designation is so ambiguous, and the designation sons of God gets a little bit confusing because of the New Testament. So I formulated my own term, elder race. Why? Because clearly these beings are older than we are, mm -hmm. and they certainly constitute a race. And every time we encounter the elder race, these angelic beings, in the biblical narrative, forget about, for the time being, prophetic iconography. We're not talking about visions and dreams. Mm -hmm. We're talking about within the actual narrative of the story. Yeah. Every time we encounter them, they look like us. Rather, we look like them. And they eat and they drink and they interact with us for all intents and purposes, just like other human beings. In fact, we all know that Paul writes that uh, he, he encourages the church to entertain strangers because some have entertained angels unawares. And how can you entertain these heavenly beings unawares? Because they look like us. But again, rather, we look like them. So here we have a race of entities that are, that are within the biblical narrative that are obviously, they obviously pre-exist us. They display all the same attributes in terms of our, the things I mentioned earlier, our emotional complexity, our capacity for rational thought, our creativity. Clearly this elder race displays all of these same attributes and we look like them. So one can only conclude that they also bear the image of God. And there is no, there is not a single verse in the Bible or any extra biblical text that, that says that mankind alone bears the image of God. This is a wholly contrived doctrine, and yet it's brandied about with such confidence. And I don't know where the confidence comes from. It, some, I guess some people think that if mankind loses its exclusivity on the image of God, that which makes mankind special, perhaps, in their minds, then somehow the biblical narrative collapses. But this is absurd. So, in fact, the opposite is true. 
I believe that the image of God is born by the sons of God collectively, that all of the sons in the family of God bear the image of their father. Rather, in truth, we bear the image of the preeminent son, of the, of, of the son of God, uh, who is the express image of his father, according to the New Testament. And so it's a familial signet, this image that we bear, which is associated with our genome. All of the sons of God in heaven or on earth, meaning Adam and the angels, bear the image of their father because they're part of the same family. Now, the terminology that's employed in the Bible is not incidental. And sometimes I feel like we we treat it as if it's incidental. It's not incidental, it is intentional. What do I mean by that? The, the terminology, so much of the terminology is familial. It pertains to a family. This term, sons of God, is exceedingly important because we know, according to the genealogy of Jesus of Nazareth, who was the son of Joseph in one account, the son of Mary in the other, traces his lineage back through Solomon, through David, through Abraham, then back through the Old Testament patriarchs, through Noah, through Methuselah, through Enoch, through Seth, who was the son of Adam, and Adam, who was the son of God. That's what the genealogy says. So Adam was a son of God. He was created to be part of the family, a member of the royal family. A sibling in the divine family. And so these other sons of God, as we've said, pre-existed Adam, clearly. They shouted for joy when the earth was created, therefore they are his elder siblings in this family. Again, the terminology is not incidental. It's intentional. We need to embrace this terminology and understand what the gospel really is. It's about returning Adam and his offspring. It's about bringing them back into the family of God. And, 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 and mankind has an older sibling, and that older sibling bears the image of God as well. And so this has to, this connects this is intricately connected with the birthright of mankind because the sons of God are created for two purposes. Number 1, to fellowship with the father. They're created to be members of the family and to have fellowship in the divine family, to interact with their maker. And secondly, they're created to have authority. They're the royal sons. And so they're created to have authority. Mankind, Adam, was created to be the vice regent of this realm we call earth, which is not the only realm, by the way, according to the scriptures. There is a plurality of realms. Yeah. Now, that gets me in trouble because people say, oh, that's a plurality of realms doctrine. And the Jesuits, you know, talk about plurality of realms. I don't care who talks or doesn't talk about plurality of realms, whether it be Jesuits or Mormons. It makes no difference to me. <laughs> I'm only interested yeah. in the narrative. Come on. And so according to the narrative, there is clearly a plurality of realms. How can I say that? Because let's recall one of the primary titles, well, I shouldn't say one of the primary titles. Let's recall an interesting title that is used of the Son of God in the book of Daniel. Prince of Princes, referring to the Son of God. Think about that term, Prince of Princes. Let's, now let's fast forward to the book of Revelation. Let's, let's recall another title ascribed to the Son of God. King of of kings and Lord of lords. Now, when we find these, the juxt juxtaposition of, of titles of regency like this, I think we are, I think we can conclude that we're talking about two different realms. 
one in which there are kings and one in which there are lords. And so I believe that the kingdom of heaven is clearly comprised of many realms. It's more like an empire. And, and the king of heaven, the son of God, is king and lord over all. But there are princes in the kingdom of heaven, clearly. And what do princes do? They govern. In fact, what is a prince a palady? A principality is a realm governed by a prince. Now, I know that the word principality in the medieval Catholic sense was used to, to indicate a, an entity, an archon, um, but, but nevertheless, a principality is, a, is not an entity, the word in English at least, it is, it is a realm governed by a prince. And there are certainly realms governed by princes in the kingdom of heaven. Otherwise, these titles have no meaning. And so Adam was created as a member, a sibling in the family of God. And he was given the vice regency of planet Earth as a son of God. And he was supposed to rule according to the precepts of the kingdom of heaven and the will of its king. By the way, the kingdom of heaven is not an airy, fairy, supernatural, metaphysical place. It has locality somewhere in our universe. Right. Yeah. And there's reasons I say that. It has locality. And so uh, Adam was supposed to govern in that manner, as I just described. But because he was divorced, sundered from the family of God, he now is... is to some extent on his own, governing a world in a fallen condition and, and making a mess of things. So the birthright of Adam is dominion of the earth. It is not merited, but inherited by his offspring. I'll say that again. The birthright of Adam, dominion of the earth, is not merited. That's, that's clearly evident. In other words, it doesn't belong just to the righteous, but rather to the offspring of Adam for all time. Paul says that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And indeed, the birthright of Adam, dominion of the earth, was not revoked even after the flood of Noah. Even though he lost dominion of the earth for a short period of time, not actually a short period of time, a significant period of time before the flood, Adam lost the birthright. That's called the Genesis 6 affair. And it was usurped by hybrids who were human enough to appropriate the birthright of Adam and take seize dominion. They happened to be giants. And, and so the seizing of man's dominion was facilitated by their by their enormous size and, and also superior intelligence, I think we can surmise, because they were the offspring of the angels, of, these, of the other sons of God, the watchers, and human women. And so they would have inherited some of those extraordinary capabilities, not just brute strength, because they were giants, but also an intellectual capacity likely much greater than that of Mankind, although mankind at that time was much more physically robust and intellectually, let's say, powerful, capable than we are today, because they were closer to the source, they were closer to Adam, and they didn't have as much degeneration, genetic degeneration as we do today. So, to recap all of that, Mankind was created to be a member of the family. He has el there are elder siblings in this family that pre-exist us. We were created in the image of God, which we share with the siblings in the royal family. We were created for fellowship and to govern the earth specifically. The birthright of mankind is the deed of the earth passed down through the offspring of Adam and Eve. 
that birthright is not merited. It is inherited through our genome. The Bible says that if a righteous man rules, the people rejoice. If a wicked man rules, the people mourn. We are responsible to govern the earth. We choose our rulers and we get the rulers we deserve. Now, God, because the Son of God is the King, He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, He reserves the right. It is His prerogative to, to enthrone or dethrone any ruler whenever He sees fit. That is His prerogative. And He does it. Right. In the, in the Old Testament, we see that he does this He does this quite often. We get the rulers we deserve for the most part, except in special cases when God uh, overrides our decisions and appoints or deposes rulers based on his will. But this authority of the earth, it's v this, the authority of mankind, the birthright, dominion of the earth, in my estimation, is essential for the unfolding of events at the end of the age, to understand the unfolding of events at the end of the age. And I will pause now. I think I've uh, summarized, maybe I haven't, let me know, the, the, the birthright <laughs> explained it to some, no, that's, to some extent. I would like you to touch on something that listening to you in the past few years has really impacted me. Um, and it's something that I think Christians don't think about one of the things, the many things we don't think about, um, the idea of the spiritual and the physical being closer than we think. You know, we have this idea as Christians that the spirit realm is this ethereal, you know, highfalutin place like you were talking about. You know, it's just in the wind out there somewhere. And, you know, the physical is real and yeah. it's right here. Uh, but I love the way you articulate how the physical and the spiritual are a lot closer than we think. And the one that really brought it home for me was you were talking about Elijah one time and how a chariot came, he got inside of it and he went away <laughs> physically. It wasn't like a vision. It wasn't a, a spiritual thing. It was like he physically got in it and he physically was taken somewhere. And that really, I was like, Oh wow. I'm just never, I don't know why. I just never thought about it. We're not it. taught to think of it in that way. We're taught to think Ex of it as some intangible, ethereal thing. Right, exactly. Yes, uh, you know, Elijah, Elisha, remember, Elijah try, kept trying to get Elisha to depart from him, but Elisha wouldn't depart from him. Right. He, would, he wanted to be there when the Lord took him away to receive the anointing. And there came a moment in time when Elisha was with Elijah, when he saw this craft descend to, to pick Elijah up and, and uh, to pick Elijah up. And Elisha cried out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And this craft, because that's what it was, landed. Elijah got into it and then it took off and went somewhere. Now that, that <laughs> necessarily doesn't mean that it took Elijah to heaven. It might, it might have just taken Elijah somewhere else on the earth. Somewhere else, yeah. Which right. may have been the case with Enoch as well. Right. Yeah. I don't know. There's you can you can debate that on both sides. But the this the chariots of Israel, also called the chariots of God in the Old Testament, are advanced aerospace vehicles. Mm -hmm. They are not flying horses. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Santa Claus isn't real. We know that there's no such thing as Santa Claus be, for one of the reasons is because reindeer don't fly. <laughs> right. Sleds don't fly. Sleds are meant to be pulled through the snow by horses or reindeer or caribou or something like that. Yeah. So we know as adults that it would it's silly to think that reindeer fly. So why do we yeah. think that horses fly? Mm. Horses don't fly. They're not created to fly. Birds are created to fly. Birds have wings. Horses don't. Chariots are not created to fly. Chariots have wheels and are pulled by horses. So why do we think that whatever that thing was that picked Elijah up, was a chariot with wheels and horses. A logical thinker would simply reject that notion and understand that what's being described is the closest approximation 
based on the context of the ancient Near East. So what's being described is in the context of the most advanced form of conveyance that was known at that time, which was a chariot. They had, the, these ancient people, they had no other way to explain a, a flying vehicle without wheels and being pulled by horses. They had no other words for this. Now, as my, the late Michael Heiser used to point out, he would be on the other side of this argument. He would argue that, that, that in fact, they were describing what they saw, but I think clearly they were not. And, and Heiser would say that, well, they did have words for shiny and metal and so forth. Yeah, but, but shiny and metal's one thing, but if you've got this object that's flying, you have to describe it in a way that conveys a vehicle of conveyance. Not just shiny. There was a shiny thing floating or something. No. In their minds, this there had to be some sort of animals pulling this thing through the sky. Mm -hmm. Because that's the only conceptualization they could have possibly had. Right. Because they were sense of it in their own minds. These were Iron Age people. Right, yeah. And so how can a craft move? How can a vehicle move? through the sky, let, or, let alone on the ground, without some sort of beast of burden pulling it. It's impossible yeah. in the, to the ancient mind. That can't happen. That's impossible. So, so they're describing these vehicles, and it's not Elijah isn't the only example. They're describing these chariots of Israel in the best way they know how. Chariots of fire. And so I don't think that there's any reason whatsoever for modern rational thinkers to look back at that story or any of these examples in the Old Testament and conclude that angels were flying around the sky in chariots with horses, just like Santa Claus with a sleigh and reindeer. It's the same logic. Right, yeah. And I reject both of those propositions equally. There is no sleigh flying through the sky, being pulled by reindeer, and there, there are no chariots flying through the sky, being pulled by horses. Yep. So I, they I chose agree. a word that described a vehicle, <laughs> the, the chariot, instead of saying something that was shiny and, and could fly. They said, this exactly. is a vehicle. Yeah. Because shiny, shiny metal things don't fly. In the, in the mind of, the, of an Iron Age thinker, shiny metal things don't fly. They have no conceptualization for an aircraft. Yeah. The yeah. only thing that they can understand is a vehicle being pulled by beasts of burdens. That's it. Right. Yeah. Or maybe an, a ship on the ocean. Mm -hmm. But boats are on the water. This thing came down and landed. And so we are entitled, based on the the narrative of the Old Testament and the narrative of the, of, the, of the Bible taken as a whole, Old and New Testament, we are entitled as rational thinkers, believers, we are entitled to conceptualize these vehicles in modern terms. We are not, we are not somehow forced to think like Iron Age people. We don't have to think like Iron Age people. We don't have to. It doesn't make you a more accurate uh, it doesn't make it it, it 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 doesn't help there's no advantage in thinking like an iron age person when reading the scriptures unless you're trying to understand the cultural context in which things are occurring and that is very useful that is very advantageous but when we look at technology we understand today we have craft that flies without anything pulling it whatsoever airplanes Right? So we can understand how a helicopter can land and somebody can get in it and take off. That makes sense to us. So um, that's, uh, I think that's part of deconstructing what I would call a Sunday school perspective or a Sunday school perception of these, these, the biblical narrative and start to maybe um, allow ourselves to think in modern terms for, for, for some of the things that we're encountering. Yeah. How did you, how did you get to where you had to, like what helped you 
switch that way of thinking uh, from maybe how you were taught or how most of us are taught in church and seminary? What was the switch that you were like, you know what? I'm thinking about this the wrong way, maybe. David Flynn, the author David Flynn, his book, Cydonia, is what really shattered my paradigm. I was already, you know, I was already expanding my paradigm, but when I read Cydonia three times, shattered my paradigm. And then I would say this, this particular topic, that angels are using technology flying around in advanced aerospace vehicles, I was, let's say that my perception really was altered after a after a specific conversation I had with Gary Stearman. And I don't know if you're familiar with Gary Stearman. He's a Bible teacher, Prophecy Watchers, excellent Bible teacher. Everybody should, should look up Gary Stearman. Um, he's got an organization called, a ministry called Prophecy Watchers. And, and Gary Stearman is, is, a, is a superb Bible teacher. He's a scholar. And he had a, and I won't, I won't, recount his personal experience here, but he had a personal experience in which he's a pilot in which his, his prop plane was having electrical, an electrical issue, a fel, an electrical failure. And he probably would have died had not this craft, shiny walnut shaped craft come alongside his plane and stabilized it and communicated with him, by the way. And Gary walked away with the distinct impression that these were angels. And when he said that, it just sort of it was like a Rubik's cube, like the last, the last piece was clicked into place in my head that lined up all these colors. And I realized, wait a minute, of course, angels are going to be using advanced aerospace vehicles. What do we expect them to be using? Horses? They're not, you know, I mean, what do we expect them to, to be using for as vehicles of conveyance? And clearly they use vehicles of, of conveyance. In other words, they use what we might describe as aircraft. Mm. This is this is evident in the biblical narrative. People say, no, they just disappear, appear and disappear. There is no proof whatsoever, no indication that angels just pop in and out of existence, like I dream of genie, you know, just, just instantly transport themselves from yeah. one place to another. In fact, quite the opposite. Remember that when Daniel was praying, God dispatched, was it Michael? No, Gabriel. Mm. To, to go and, and speak to Daniel, but Gabriel was hindered. So he's traversing time and space to get to Daniel. It's not just, I dream of genie, cross your arms and, and blink your eyes, and boom, he's, he's there. No, he had to traverse. There was a distance that had to be traversed for, for Gabriel to get, and it was Gabriel, correct, to get from <laughs> where he was dispatched to where Daniel was. So right. he had to he traverse had a, had the distance. And, and, in this, and in this journey, he was hindered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because otherwise he could have just popped into the room. Otherwise right, yeah. he could have just popped into the room like a but genie. Tim, but Tim, angels have wings and they fly wherever they want. I was going to mention that too. I think <laughs> most people would just imagine angels have wings and there they are, just glide in. There are no scholars, good scholars, that would ever affirm the notion no that angels scholars. have wings. The angels do not have wings ever in, within the biblical narrative. They right, only right. have wings in the context of prophetic iconography. Visions and dreams. And, and that yeah. is what it is. It's visions and dreams. Now, people forget that, let's use Daniel as an example that, or Isaiah, or one of the Old Testament prophets, that these prophets were not transported to heaven. Rather, they had open visions, or they went into trances. Okay, so what's happening? Perceptual. Their perception is being hijacked in order to display information to them, convey a message. So we know that this is the, the case because, because one of the prophets, I forget which one, talks about how he was writing by the, the, the bank of the river or he was resting by the bank of the river. I can't remember the, exactly what he was doing. Then suddenly he had a vision or a trance came on him. John on the island of Patmos said that he was, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day when, boom, all these divisions and the Son of Man appeared before him. And so 
it's in this trance state in this in this it's a perception it's a and i don't want to use the this term is not i'm not using it as a pejorative as a negative term the the perception is being hijacked your perception is being hijacked and if somebody walked up to one of these prophets even john on patmos they probably would just see john standing there or sitting there looking staring at the the cave wall or whatever, wherever he was, or out over the ocean, or Daniel, or Isaiah, just sitting there in a trance state, as this person is having this perceptual experience, uh, almost like a virtual reality scenario playing out. Because what's happening is their consciousness, there's information being downloaded into their consciousness in the form of a vision or dream. Dreams also, by the way. So... So God is communicating to them in a, in a, by, by manipulating their perception. That's what dreams are, too, when God communicates to us. And so what these individuals are seeing is, is the information necessary to deliver a package, to deliver information, which is encrypted, by the way. So um, when we encounter angels, or anything for that matter, within the context of prophetic iconography, a trance, a vision, a dream, we should not interpret those things literally because those are perceptual artifacts. Yes, designed by God, being delivered by the will of God, communicating to this person, to the prophet, but not literal. And so this is where people get carried away because they they forget that these are subjective perceptual experiences now that doesn't mean that they're not true they're they're clearly true i mean the future is predicted with a hundred percent accuracy within these perceptual experiences by these prophets because it precisely because it is a message from god right which which the the predictive nature of prophecy is the signature of the maker Only God can predict the future. He alone is outside of space and time. And so he sees the whole thing as, you know, he sees the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. God has that perspective, but because he's outside of creation, but we don't have that perspective because we are within creation. So if God is going to deliver a message to mankind and seal the message, sign it himself, his signature is that he can predict the future. And only he can predict the future with 100% accuracy. That's why in the Old Testament, if a prophet prophesied something that was false, he was in big trouble. Yeah. Because God gets it right 100% of the time. Again, it's his signature. Yeah. The devil doesn't predict the future. Evil spirits don't depict the future. They can can guess at the future. They can... um, they can make a, an, an, an educated uh, inference about the future, but they cannot predict the future with 100% accuracy. Only a being outside of space and time can do that. And so that information communicated to mankind through prophets is perceptual. Yeah. And so should not be interpreted literally rather the information the message needs to be interpreted and we all know that this is true i always like to refer to nebuchadnezzar's dream he had several dreams and he summoned daniel to come interpret it because his his uh what would we call them mystics his magicians his magicians couldn't interpret his dream so he summons daniel from jail from prison and daniel through the spirit of God and and the wisdom of God is able to interpret these dreams. And he didn't, and obviously Nebuchadnezzar's dreams weren't literal. They were encoded with information and that information had to be unpacked and it required the spirit of God operating in Daniel to be able to accurately unpack that information, which was by the way, practical functional information, which saved, um, and the same with Joseph, by the way, which saved, um, actually, I, I, I conflated those two stories. Joseph was the one who was in uh, prison. Um, Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, Joseph, and, and Pharaoh, which saved in both cases, well, and in, in in specifically in the case of uh, Joseph, saved the people from famine, the, the, the Egyptians from famine, and other nations as well, 
literally save their lives by interpreting um, the dream and Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream um, predicted the future with, with, with extreme accuracy regarding the empires that would arise. Of course, I'm referring to the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the, uh, the statue that was cast in different metals, which predicted in, in, in quite with, 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 in, in, in a remarkable way, predicted the empires that were going to arise in the wake of his empire. Yeah. And uh, Daniel was promoted very quickly after that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't remember the context of Daniel uh, interpreting that dream. I know that Joseph was in, was in prison. Yeah. Um, I don't remember if that, if that uh, was true of Daniel as well, but, um, but certainly both Joseph and Daniel were able to interpret the dreams because the dreams were not literal. Yeah. That's the point I'm trying to make here. The right. dreams were not literal. And so prophecy and dreams and communications from God have to be unpacked. Right. It's like a zipped folder, right? When you, when you download a large file off the internet, many times that file is zipped. The information is compressed within the folder. And yeah. so you got the zipped folder on your desktop, and, you're, and no one says, oh, that's it. That's the information. I got it. No, we all understand <laughs> yeah. that the information is contained within the folder. Right. The folder has to be unzipped, uncompressed in order to extract the details of the data inside the folder. And so if we interpret visions and dreams and prophetic words, uh, uh, rather prophetic experiences in the Bible, literally, it's like looking at a zipped folder and thinking that we have the interpretation. Yeah, which is different, uh, you're saying, than like narrative parts of the Bible, like uh, like in when Abraham saw the three men approaching, you know, they, they existed in the physical world. It's a totally different situation. Yeah. That is that is the narrative playing out, the, the, the historical narrative. And in every case, these beings, these sons of God, sometimes accompanied by the son of God, the preeminent yeah, son yeah. of God. Himself. The angel of the Lord. They yeah. sit down with Abraham and they, sh- and they have a meal. It's wild. They sit down and they literally eat and drink. They don't pretend to eat and drink as people email me all the time. No, no, they're just pretending. <laughs> okay, well, the burden of proof is on you. It's on right. you. If you say they're pretending, you have to show me, prove to me that they're pretending because I'm just reading the narrative as it is. And I have every reason to believe that that's exactly what they did. The burden of proof isn't on me. It's on you. If you're going to gainsay what is plainly written in the narrative, they eat and drink. Yeah. They did so with Abraham and then Lot. Remember those, the two angels who walked into the city of Sodom. And by the way, there's something different about them because Lot recognized them. Yes, Why would he recognize yes. these angels? Because it, because his mm. uncle Abraham told him about told him what they look like. So these look mm. like men, but they probably had blue eyes and blonde hair and fair skin, which would have. And this isn't a racial commentary, by the way. I I I, right, I, right. I get so angry when people try and inject uh, it, 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 political issues and racism and stuff into this commentary. Yeah. No, this has nothing sure, to do yeah. with 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 racism or 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 ethnicity on Earth, mm. but. Um, but I think that there was something there was there was something unique about these two men that walked into Sodom. They were unique enough to be able to be identified by Lot, but not so unique that they were that they were considered to be anything other than men. OK, think about that. So there's something interesting about them, probably fair skin, clear eyes and blonde or golden blonde hair. Probably. That's what I think. And I have other reasons for believing that. They're, uh, they're very handsome men. They're very comely men. We know that because all of the homosexuals in Sodom gathered around their door, around Sodom's door, demanding that these men be brought out to be sodomized. And of course, we know what happens. Uh, they're all struck blind. But these, but these men, these angels, what we, sometimes we forget what happens that evening. Do we remember what happens that evening? They supped with Lot. They ate and drink with Lot in his home. Let's not gloss over that. That's profound. They ate and drank. And then they went to sleep. If I recall, <laughs> if I recall the story, they, 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 
uh, maybe I'm not recalling the story. Uh, I say certainly. I don't actually. Let me retract that. Maybe they didn't go to sleep. They certainly they stopped. Well, you know, they after st- cursing all the men of Sodom, they probably got kind of tired. You know. Right. Exactly. So they they, <laughs> they supped with Lot certainly. Yeah. And uh, before escorting him out of the city, um, mm-hmm. it was destroyed. Maybe by some sort of directed energy weapon. Mm. Obliterated. And uh, and so we are entitled, as I keep saying, we are entitled to draw a logical conclusion from the data that we have in the narrative. And a logical conclusion isn't that they're pretending to eat and drink, isn't that they're pretending to show up in vehicles of conveyance, advanced aerospace vehicles that can fly. No, no, no. They're not pretending to do these things. They just are doing these things. And what we have are Iron Age people trying to make sense of this. Yeah. Well, we don't have the same problem as Iron Age people. We right. can fly. Yep. And we know it's because we have the agency of technology. Right, right. So do so they. I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard the theory of uh, albinism, you know, from the book of Noah, uh, the fragments of the book of Noah and the book of Enoch, speaking about Noah and his appearance, and maybe that being a reference to some sort oh, yes. of albinism. And oh, yeah. Maybe the angels looked like they maybe had albinism because they looked, yes. you know, people with extreme albinism, it's like, whoa, that's a stark image right, right. there. White like, hair, like white yeah, hair, white skin. Some even eyes. have red eyes. And right. wow, it's wild. And people tell me, you know, because there is in the book of Noah, a fragment from the book of Noah, which is actually included in most copies of the book of Enoch, mm-hmm. um, in, which, in which Noah's father, uh, Methuselah, was was and mother were quite shocked when Noah was born. And what did they say of him? He has like, fair skin, clear eyes, or whatever it was. Yeah, he looks yeah. like a son of God, one of the a sons son of, of God. God. So crazy. Okay. So I'm not shooting in the dark. I'm glad you brought right. that up. I'm not shooting in the yeah. dark here. And people will write to me and say, well, it just sounds like Noah had, what did you say? Uh, what's that called again? I forget what that's called. Albinism, yeah, albino. Albino, so no, right. That, that no Noah was an albino. Paper. Well, you're missing the point. It's not that Noah was an albino. Don't, I don't care whether Noah was an albino. The point right. is that because of this, this appearance, they thought that this was another son of God or that maybe, that maybe Noah, that Methuselah's wife had somehow been impregnated mm-hmm. because that was going on during that time with the watcher. Yeah, it sure was. And the daughters yeah. of men. So... There was a there is a very real concern here for Methuselah. Um, wait a minute. I'm, Lam- I, I think I'm getting. Oh, I, think I'm getting yeah, I think I'm getting this wrong as well. Who was it? Was it Methuselah or Lamech? You're good. Father, You're a busy man. Lamech. Yeah, Lamech. Lamech, would, Lamech ran out of the house and went to Methuselah. He's like, "Holy crap!" So it was both. Guess what? <laughs> right, it was both of them. That's right. Yeah, they yeah. were. They were. They were conversing together. Yeah. So yeah. it was Lamech was the father of Noah. Methuselah right, was go. his grandfather. Good job, good job. So you know, so all of this sort of gets scrambled in my brain sometimes. But, it's a lot, yeah. But uh, but you're right. Line. So so there was this, you know, because this was the righteous line of Seth. They're yeah. not involved in the miscegenation of the Watchers with human women, of the of these sons of God who were taking human women and copulating, taking them as wives and copulating with them, and, and the women were conceiving and giving birth to giants. So this wasn't the miscegenation of the Watchers. And so that's why, I mean, this was the context, uh, this was going on. And that's why there would have been such a, a concern when Noah popped out looking like one of the sons of God, like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, you know, (laughs) so yeah, definitely. That's a good point. I'm 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 glad glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. Since we made it back around to Genesis six. Now I had a thought when, uh, or book of Enoch technically, but, uh, when you were talking about the birthright earlier, I wanted to ask with the sons of God, do you think, um, I guess it's kind of a two part question. First is, were they working, um, uh, for or in, in sync with the serpent from Genesis three? Do you think they were allies or separate parties? And then I guess the second thing would be, um, you mentioned in the birthright that, you know, earth was the realm of, of Adam and his descendants. Mm -hmm. Um, did the watchers think they were going to come down and just take over? Or do you think they, they had that knowledge and knew they had to have these hybrid children to take over? Um, yeah. Lamech was Noah's father, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, 
I believe, and I, and I postulate in the book, I hypothesize in the book that although we're not told directly that the dragon, who is, by the way, the dragon, in the biblical narrative, the dragon is the chief of sinners in the cosmos. He is the Judas of the morning stars, of the sons of God. So we know that chief of sinners among men is Judas. Um, because he betrayed the Son of God. Well, guess what? Somebody else betrayed the Son of God. A member of the elder race betrayed the Son of, Son of God. In fact, in my book, I, ah, yeah. I, I show how Judas's interactions with Jesus were sort of a, veil, a veiled reference to the dragon's interaction with the Son of God previous to mankind being created, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, because betrayal has a name among men, Judas Iscariot. Betrayal has a name among angels, but you know what? We don't know what that name is because Satan, this entity we call Satan, because the Ha Satan, the Satan, is actually it's it's actually a, a plural term. You can have multiple Satans, you can have multiple devils, but there is this one particular character who is referenced, I think, most accurately as the dragon, uh, who John says is that serpent of old who was with Eve in the Garden of Eden, the beguiler of Eve, that character is most reviled. And he is such a despicable character that he's never actually named. He is like Voldemort, Voldemort from Harry Potter, he who should not be named. You know who. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, uh, he's, he's, Patronum, such, man. he's such a despicable <laughs> character that, that he's not given the... Uh, the honor of, of a name in the scriptures. He's just referred to as the dragon, the serpent, the Satan, the devil. And so this character, I believe, was on the scene, obviously. I think, by the way, that this is the same, that this entity in the Garden of Eve wasn't a serpent, obviously. It was a, it was a person. It was, it, was a, it, was an, it was a member of the elder race. It was this, it was the chief betrayer the chief rebel, this character who I'm, who the Bible calls the dragon. Um, that's who I believe was in the garden with Eve. And I do believe that he had a hand in the Genesis six affair, although he didn't get his hands directly sullied like the watchers who descended to the earth. And I think I lost track of your question. Is this the, is this the question that you were asking? What, what was his yeah, involvement? Yeah. 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 I was saying this guy, is he coordinating or, or working with, the watchers in the Genesis six story, or do you think that this is a separate party that they're, they've got their own agenda? Well, I think they have their own agenda, but I think they're being influenced, perhaps even tempted by him, but he keeps his hands clean because he's not in, he's not implicated in the judgment. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that comes down on the watchers. Whereas he is directly implicated in the judgment of Eve and of yeah. the serpent. So he probably could have beguiled these sons of God sure. to go rogue, much like he did with Eve and Adam. They would have known exactly who he is, right? And uh, and I, you know, I believe that, and I think it's probably evident that this character, the dragon, because Lucifer is a misnomer, by the way, but we don't have to get into right, that. Right. But this character of the dragon uh, was the chief among the morning stars. He, he, in the hierarchy of the kingdom, he was second in the kingdom. He, he was second only to the Son of God, the preeminent Son of God himself. That's the intimation that we get. Um, and so I think that he did have a hand in tempting these sons of God, these watchers, as they're called. By the way, the watcher designation is not exclusive to extra-biblical texts. It's not just the Book of Enoch that uses it. In the Book of Daniel, we find it in a very intriguing scenario, by the way, which smacks of the divine counsel for those who are familiar with Heiser's work, in which the Watchers are passing judgment on Nebuchadnezzar. So the Watchers are obviously, I think what we're talking about here is what Heiser would have called the divine, calls the divine counselor, counsel, what I would label as the princes among the elder race. That's who these beings are, the Watchers. So these are not, in my estimation, serpentine, reptilian being, reptilian. Uh, beings or some kind of, uh, you know, 
again, with the cherubim, with the four faces, uh, or uh, referencing prophetic iconography, that's prophetic icon- iconography. When you, when you see the descriptions of cherubim, seraphim, all these other creatures, understand that this is prophetic iconography. It's not a literal depiction. It's not an anatomical diagram. Um, so, so the watchers defected from the kingdom of heaven. These are princes in the kingdom. These are very high-ranking beings, sons of God. Okay, these are members of the family who are defecting. And uh, and so I believe that uh, you know their their defection, by the way, wasn't was not. It was not impulsive. They're, they had a plan. And the Book of Enoch, which maybe your audience is f- familiar with the Book of Enoch. Uh, uh, by the way, the, the reference in Genesis 6 that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And so they took wives among all, among all of whom they chose. And then it says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, Genesis 6, first couple of Genesis, verses of Genesis 6, that was copied and pasted from the book of Enoch. So the writer of Genesis, whether it was Moses or someone else, was referencing directly, copying and pasting the text from the book of Enoch into his account. And it required no further explanation. Why did it require no further explanation? Because it was already well known in, in the ancient Hebrew yeah. cosmology. Everybody knew the story of Enoch. That's crazy. You even clear. see that in the New Testament as well. Oh, the yeah. New Testament writers also quote directly verbatim from Enoch. Exactly. It's and very prevalent. That's right. And Enoch uh, was known to the Israelites very well known at the time of Christ, because the title that Jesus used of himself more often than all others is not a title from the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. from from the Old Testament canon. Rather, it is a title that comes directly from the book of Enoch, the Son of man, yeah. not the reference yeah. in Daniel where Daniel says, I saw one who was like a like, son yeah. of man. That's just saying I saw someone who looked like a human, a son of man. No, right, yeah. this is a definite title, the son of man who will be coming with the clouds of heaven. That's why the, 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 the Caiaphas tore his robes when Jesus referenced that because it was coming directly out of the book of Enoch and also out of some Old Testament passages as well. Um, and it was, uh, this title of, of, of the Messiah, the son of man. That was a title of the Messiah from the book of Enoch. Yeah. And that's, a whole and that was, of- was that tied to, uh, kind of the messianic theme of Enoch in the book of Enoch? He was kind of a messianic. Yes, that's right. Enoch figure. was a type of Christ. Right, right. Um, and so that's why he's called you son of man as well. Right. In the book. Of yeah. Enoch. And I've heard, I've heard people on the internet that like, Oh, we shouldn't read the book of Enoch. You know, it teaches that Enoch was a Messiah. Oh no, 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 Jesus no. The, the book of Messiah. Enoch. Yeah. The book like, of Enoch uh, was de- 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 rejected by the Masoretes, uh, the, the Jewish scribes who, who, who put together the, the, the Hebrew old Testament that most people carry around in their hands cool. today. The Masoretes, yeah rejected the book of Enoch precisely because of its messianic content pointing directly to Jesus of Nazareth. That's something. The book of Enoch has the most remarkable messianic prophecies anywhere. It does. And, yeah. the, and the most detailed. And, uh, and certainly the first part of the book of Enoch was written before Christ. I think that Enoch 3, Enoch 3, the one that the, the, one that the Ethiopic Christian church has had in its canon since the beginning. Still have, yeah. Um, that version of Enoch is BC. It's before Christ. And in fact, the New Testament writers are drawing on it all the time. And one of them, the writer of Jude, actually copies and pastes a prophecy right. in yeah. Enoch chapter Jude, one. Peter Paul directly references the uh the when he's talking about head coverings. That's right. It's like yes. we need to do this because of the angels. Because that of the makes angels. no That's right. sense. That's right. You cannot separate the book of Enoch from new, from the new, from the Old Testament or the New Testament. Yeah. It's baked in. Right. You just have to accept yeah. it. It is <laughs> it is part of the of the Hebrew cosmology, the ancient Hebrew cosmology. You cannot take the book of Enoch away from the scriptures. So many of the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, are are reference the book of Enoch or stories are taking place in the context, the grander narrative from the book of Enoch, such as Genesis right. six. 
Yeah. So, which was copied and pasted. Those first two, the, 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 those verses in Enoch are, are identical that the yeah. sons of God, but it, but in this case, it calls them the watchers of heaven. Uh, by the way, the Septuagint says the angels of heaven. Septuagint was the Greek version of the Old Testament compiled by 70 scribes, hence Septuagint. That's what the word means, 70. And, uh, and that version literally says the angels of heaven. So there's no getting around the fact that these are celestial beings. These are not terrestrial men. These are celestial right. members of the right. elder race. Right. And so they were. They had a plan, again, going back to what I was saying, they were, they were not driven simply by um, uh, by some sort of haphazard impulse to do what they did. They had a very specific plan in mind. And I was struggling to, to say that because they were driven by a sexual impulse that was part of the equation because the first thing it yeah. says in the book of Enoch is that these the watchers, they look down at the daughters of... Adam, the daughters of men, and they lusted after them. They lusted. Yep. So yes, part of this equation is the fact that they lusted after human women. Okay, well, full stop. Because <laughs> what, does, what does that mean that these heavenly beings, who I would say are high-ranking members of the elder race, what are the implications that they're lusting after human women? You got a real problem if you're a theologian here and you think that angels are just spiritual beings. You got a real problem here. Because if a man is, let's say, let's just say you take a, a human being and you castrate that man, his sexual impulses go away. At least to a large extent. Why? Why do they go away? Because his equipment has been removed. His sexual organs have been neutered. So how do you have sons of God, members of the elder race, this angelic faction, looking down and lusting after human women? That means that these guys are a lot more like us than we, than we were led to believe, that, we, that, that we've thought. They have the physical capacity to lust because they have physical bodies. Now, their nature is higher than ours. They're not human beings. Remember, David says that man was created, mankind was created to be a little lower, a little lower yeah. than the heavenly beings, than the Elohim, than the heavenly beings, a little lower. Mm -hmm. But we're not so different from them. Right. These are not just ethereal beings and we're physical beings. No, these beings clearly are physical beings. Remember, we are physical and spiritual beings. We're a composite of both of these things. And, and I don't have a spiritual Tim and a physical Tim. There isn't soul Tim and spirit Tim and flesh Tim. There's just Tim. <laughs> That's it. It's one package. Yeah. And, and so this, this, the physical and the spiritual, right. let's say the physical and the metaphysical are two sides of the same coin. They're integrated, and they were, they're supposed to be integrated. And for people who doubt this, they think that, well, when we die, we're going to be like the angels. We're going to be spiritual beings. No, we're not. We're, we're going to be bodily resurrected. Yep, new bodies. Our bodies are going to be resurrected. We're not going to get new bodies in the sense that they're unlike the bodies that we currently have. Yep because that would not be a resurrection. Our yeah. bodies are going to be resurrected. That's why when Christ was resurrected as a first fruits demonstration, other yeah. people, dead people, came out of their graves. Yeah. <laughs> Christ himself bore the marks of the crucifixion. Yeah. And when he showed up to the, uh, to the disciples who disciples. were gathered together in an upper room, yeah. Jesus appears to them. He just appears. Yeah. And they're 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 freaking out because they think they're seeing a ghost. And what does Jesus say to them? Touch me. Yeah. Touch me. Mm. See that I am flesh and bone. See that I'm the spirits don't have flesh and bone. He said, see that I am flesh and bone. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they touched him. And he even still had the marks of the crucifixion in his hands and the mark of the, you know, the spear that was thrust into his side. You know, Thomas had to touch those marks in order to be convinced it was him. And then Jesus says something remarkable. This is the resurrected Christ. By the way, this is how we're going to be at the resurrection. Jesus yeah. is the first fruits, the firstborn among the dead. He says, have you, do you have anything to eat? Have you anything to eat? Why did he say that? Because he wanted to further demonstrate his corporal reality, his, phys, his physical body. This is me in the flesh. Watch me eat this fish and bread in front of you. And by extension, wow. if I'm going to eat fish and bread, that means I have a di digestive tract. Yeah. That was, well, he didn't eat for three days, man. He was hungry, bro. Right, exactly. So that <laughs> was, was hungry. <laughs> that was Jesus demonstrating that he was he was flesh and blood. It was him, just as they had known him. He has the marks of the crucifixion. There's eating and drinking in heaven. You know, there's the, the banquet of the Lamb, the, the supper of the Lamb. That's not metaphoric, that's literal. Jesus said at the Last Supper, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I do so in my Father's kingdom. There will be drink, eating and drinking. In the kingdom of heaven, just as there is eating and drinking on earth, we can go on and on and on. The, 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 the Israelites ate the bread of heaven. Manna, remember? What is it? That's what manna means. What is it? It was not bread that fell from heaven. Rather, it was grain that was collected and then baked into bread. And the psalmist calls it the sustenance of the angels, the grain of heaven. Okay, well, if we reverse engineer that thought, where does grain come from on earth? It comes from wheat. It comes from barley. It comes from these plants that we sow, and then we reap a harvest, and then we take this grain that we harvest, and we bake it into bread. So if the Israelites ate the grain of heaven, the sustenance of the angels, are we looking at extraterrestrial grain that comes from plants that were grown somewhere else, dare I say, on some other planet? Now, people will take umbrage with this and say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is a spiritual realm, or this is a dimensional, and another dimension. Well, that makes no difference to me. I've never seen a spiritual realm. I don't know what another dimension looks like. All I can tell you is that it's not here. Yeah. So it's just semantics at this point. It's What's the difference? No, Tim, it's a spiritual realm. Will you explain the difference to me between a spiritual <laughs> realm and another planet? Explain the difference to me. Yeah. There, it's semantics. The kingdom of heaven has locality. It has, it, has, it has courts. It has courtiers. It has a standing army. I mean, God in the Old Testament is called, one of the titles that is used, used most often is Lord of Armies. Lord of Hosts. What, what is the purpose of an army if not to protect the borders of a realm? the physical borders of a realm. And so if you have an army, then that immediately signals to us that there are, there's an enemy. There's an enemy. If there's no enemy, you don't need an army. Jesus said there was an enemy. He said the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. See, we spiritualize these things rather than just log drawing logical conclusions. Why are we not entitled to draw logical conclusions? We are. And so I reject these, these supernatural explanations. The word supernatural has no explanatory power. It doesn't, it doesn't explain anything. It doesn't describe anything. It's like saying manna. What is it? It has no defining power. It, it does not have explanatory power. And so I see technology. I see manna, the grain of heaven coming from plants that are grown somewhere else. By the way, the biblical narrative presumes the existence of extraterrestrials, presumes it. We already said that the sons of God shouted for joy before the earth was created. If you've got entities, sentient beings that are shouting for joy before there's, before there's even an earth, let alone Adam on earth, then how can these beings be anything other than extraterrestrial? They are by definition extraterrestrial. Extraterrestrial simply means, and we're talking about sentient beings here in the context of sentient beings, beings whose provenance is not planet Earth. So if your origin is somewhere else, you are by definition extraterrestrial. That's it. 
So Christians who sort of recoil at the, at the phrase extraterrestrial, the term extraterrestrial, are simply denying the obvious. You already believe that. You just don't like the word extraterrestrial. I'm sorry, but that is the operative word. Extraterrestrial, not from the earth. It's presumed in the biblical narrative. Presumed. There is an, an, an exceedingly ancient, exceptionally advanced, non-human civilization that pre-exists us. That is a biblical concept, clearly a biblical concept. It is an angelic civilization, dare I say, the kingdom of heaven. And the king of this civilization is the son of God. Yeah, come on. Yes, and I love the way you explain how our civilization is really based off of their civilization. Because where would we even get the idea for building civilization if we didn't have the blueprints from somewhere else? Exactly. We didn't invent civilization. We inherited it. Right. We inherited it. And, it and so all so of our institutions sense, yeah. are reflections of something that preexisted us. Yeah. The kingdom of heaven, as I said, it has, co- it has a court in yeah. terms of a judicial court. It also has courtiers. It has princes and a council. There's a council. Mm-hmm. There's an army. There are envoys, messengers. It has vehicles of conveyance, advanced aerospace vehicles of conveyance. There's eating and drinking. What are we to make of this? Exactly what we're, what we're familiar with. It's a kingdom. And, and all of these institutions that we have, our judicial system, our armies, all of these things that, that we have in our societies, were not invented by us. It was delivered to us. We were supposed to govern according to the kingdom of heaven, model the kingdom of heaven on earth, expand Eden, if you will, the governance of Eden. And Eden is simply symbolic of the father's house. What happens when I talk to people, because this is what happened to me, is, is suddenly the biblical narrative becomes very, very, very close to us. It's, you can touch it. It's a tangible thing now. I can touch it. I can hold it in my hands now. It's near to me. It's not this, this metaphysical mystery that I can't understand. No, quite the opposite. It's very, it's much more comprehensible. It's, it's tactile. We can interact with it. And, and it's much more exciting than we Yeah, thought. definitely. And that makes me take it more seriously because it's more real now. I think a lot of people, when they have this ethereal idea of, you know, the Bible and God and heaven, and it's not so serious. It doesn't seem like, oh, you know, it's just kind of a thing. But when it's real, it's made real to you in that way that you put it. It's like, man, this is serious. This is a real thing. Yeah. I To tack on to that, I, the two passages that keep coming to my head anytime this topic comes up is when Jesus ascends and he says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. And then like you mentioned earlier, Paul's saying we wage war against principalities and powers of darkness. Uh, Jesus wasn't just saying, in Paul wasn't just saying, mm-hmm. yeah, they're, they're real. It's a real places. These are real beings. Uh, who is, who is Jesus saying he has authority over in heaven? If he just meant earthly Kings or That's your right. problems, you know, I think right. a lot of yeah, people, your problems. And by the way, why did yeah. Jesus have all authority in heaven? Because he was the son of God. Why yeah. did he have yeah. all authority on earth? Because he was the son of man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Remember so, yeah. mankind was given authority on earth. He was a son of Adam. And so he could appropriate the authority of Adam on earth. He's the son of God, therefore he can appropriate, and he is the preeminent son of God. Mm. He can appropriate the the authority of his father in heaven. Mm. Well, that's a good point. So when we talk about, you know, principalities, powers, and heavenly places, what are these heavenly places? Mm. Is it the stratosphere? What is it? Is it like the clouds? What are these heavenly places? Um, people again will say they'll they'll go right to the metaphysical. Oh, it's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual realm. Do they eat and drink drink in that realm? By the way, why do angels have weapons? Yeah, they have lightsabers. Exactly, right, exactly. Why do <laughs> angels have weapons? 
<laughs> so, so, so none of the data conforms to this ethereal perspective. None of the data yeah. conforms to it. We've just invented it. We've literally just invented it. So what is a heavenly place? Might it be somewhere outside of Earth's atmosphere? Might it be in the cosmos, elsewhere in the universe, elsewhere in the solar system? Why isn't that an option? Why not? Why is that not an option? Why are we not taught to think like that? Is there something about the existence of our solar system and other planets that is anti-biblical? And now the flat earthers will chime in and say yes, but the flat earthers are wrong. The earth is not flat. Well, that's irrelevant. So, so when we say heavenly places, what are we talking about? I mean, when you look up, if you're in Australia, you're, I guess you're looking down or you're looking down and up and we're looking down up in North America, if you think about it. So a heavenly place isn't up, it's out. A heavenly place is out. Extraterrestrial, a realm that's not on earth, but has locality in the universe. Realms in the plural, realms. And so... You know, that that blows people's minds and they're thinking, now, hold on a minute. How does that equate with what? With what? With the narrative of Scripture? Easy. There's nothing here. There's no, we're not transgress, transgressing the narrative. We haven't changed anything. We literally have changed nothing. By putting all of this into tangible terms, we have changed nothing. And then people will say to me, well, whoa, 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 whoa. If there's extraterrestrials, because I think there's other sentient beings outside of the family of God who are not members of the family of God, who are sentient beings, they'll say to me, wait a minute, How, doesn't that alter the gospel of Christ? Doesn't that mean that Christ would have had to go and die for those extraterrestrials? And I say, no, just read your Bible. The answer's there. It says that, it says that Christ did not die for the angels. Aren't they an extraterrestrial race? Yes, they are. So if Christ didn't die for them, why should we think that he would be going and dying for some other extraterrestrial race? Clearly, the gospel of Christ pertains exclusively to the sons and daughters of Adam. Jesus became a man to redeem mankind. That's it. There is no theological transgression here in this, in this point of view. It doesn't exist. It's imagined. It, it's just imagined. You, there's no reason for Christians to recoil at these ideas. None whatsoever. None. It doesn't change the narrative of Scripture. It doesn't change the doctrine of Scripture. Well, I'm, I'm even thinking now, in, in the biblical narrative, the heavens could refer to the sky, looking up at the sky, and it also referred to where the stars were, which we would say space. Mm -hmm. you know, their, their whole idea of heaven was in outer, constellations and the stars. They yeah. didn't know there was such thing as outer space either. Right, right. They didn't know what the heck they were on. I mean, they didn't. Yeah. And anyone who yeah. thinks they did is mistaken. They didn't. Mm. They, just like they didn't know about quantum mechanics. Just like they didn't know about nuclear fission or nuclear fusion, just like they didn't know about electricity. They didn't know about these things. Now, that's not to say that the Bible isn't scientifically accurate, you know, as it describes the earth and the creation of the earth. That's not to say that it's not scientifically accurate. I'm just saying that there's a whole lot of things. By the way, the Son of God, when he came to the earth, Jesus is not just, you know, people sometimes accuse me of, of, making Jesus an angel. I have no idea where they get that from. It's totally antithetical to my thinking. Jesus is the preeminent Son of God who was eternal with the Father from the beginning. He was in the bosom of the Father. He's what I call the singularity. Jesus is the Big Bang, according to the New Testament. All things were created by him and through him and for him. That means he's the initial singularity in Big Bang cosmology. It, it, yes, I believe in the Big Bang. His name is Jesus. He is the Son of God. Everything was created by him and through him and for him, and in him all things consist. So this person walked among us 2,000 years ago. Walked. He wore sandals on his feet and walked on terrestrial soil 
and Galilee and Judea. The creator of the universe walked among mankind. He was born into the human race and he walked among men and he didn't tell us about quantum mechanics. He didn't tell us about electricity. He didn't tell us about the germ theory of disease. He didn't tell us about internal combustion. He didn't tell us about any of these useful things to mankind. Rather, he told us about his father, about the kingdom of heaven, and about what his mission was, covertly told us in the beginning. In fact, he spoke to us in parables, like we were little children. And his disciples said, when he would speak to them plainly, finally, you're speaking plainly to us in a way we can understand. So Jesus, the the Son of God, the singularity himself, didn't feel it necessary to tell us about, you know, these sciences that we figured out later on. So people should not be offended or surprised that the Bible doesn't address a lot of these things. The Bible never talks about the Internet. The Bible never talks about uh, motor vehicles or airplanes. And this should not surprise us. Because the message of the gospel, the message of the Bible, the primary theological message of the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. That's when when Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection with those two gentlemen, and he was confounding their perception so that they couldn't uh, recognize him, by the way. It wasn't that he looked different. It was that he was not allowing them to recognize him. And they're going through the scriptures, and he's expounding the scriptures. And these men are astounded. And what did Jesus tell them? All of these speak of me. In fact, we, that message was already delivered to us in the transfiguration, which happened on Mount Hermon, by the way, when Jesus went up with a couple of disciples up on Mount Hermon, and Jesus was transfigured before them, and they saw Moses and Elijah, right? And they said, hey, let's go. Let's go get the other guys and let's go get some some supplies and we can make tabernacles for each of you here. And then suddenly there was a cloud above them and they heard a voice emanating that said, this is my son. Hear him. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And when when the vision passed, there, wasn't, there was no more Moses and Elijah. It was just Jesus standing there before them. What was the message there? What was the message? Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. That is the Tanakh. That is the Old Testament. And the Father is saying, this is who the, all of that was about, right here in front of you. Don't worry about Moses and Elijah. Hear him. This is who those things were written about just like Jesus said. So I don't know why I got on that uh, tangent, but uh, well, it was, it was, that's good. No, that's good. And it, and it makes it applicable to us too, because I mean, that's, that's what the gospel is all about. Why, why do we even bother uh, studying and speculating on any of this stuff? It's because we're trying to know Jesus better. You know, I love, I love how you, you got that in there. Yeah. And, and it's, 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 you, you know, my, perspective my my let's let's put it this way my focus isn't on extraterrestrials or angels or giants or any of that my focus is on the gospel of christ even when i talk about extraterrestrials and when i talk about transhumanism the post human apocalypse the the through narrative in my book birthright too is is the gospel of jesus christ that's the through narrative we have to understand who we are what it means to be human, why we should be concerned with preserving our humanity, and precisely what the gospel of Christ is. It is not a social gospel. It's not about your, your best life now. It is not a social gospel. It, it, is, it, it is not about uh, equality in society. It's not, it's not about you know, economic redistribution. It's, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with bringing the sons and daughters of Adam who were divorced, sundered from the family of God, bringing them back into the family. And in order to do that, Christ had to redeem us from the swine herd, referencing the, 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 the product, the the parable of the prodigal son. He had to redeem us 
from the enemy of God with whom we were condemned because of sin. He had to bring reconciliation with the Father because we are, in a, we are in a condition of enmity with God, the New Testament writers say. We are at enmity with God. So we had to be reconciled through the cross, which means brought back into fellowship with God, brought back into friendship through the cross of Christ. The, the New Testament says that the cross of Christ brings reconciliation. So we were, we were redeemed so that we might be reconciled, so that we, we might be restored. Everything that was lost in Adam is regained in the second Adam, in the Son of God. That's the gospel of Christ. And we, be, we belittle it when we make it about other things, other things, superficial things, supercilious things. We belittle the gospel, which is a great offense to God. And so, um, you know, I, I think that the parable of the prodigal son is the most beautiful illustration of the gospel. And we don't have to talk about it, but for those who are wondering, I do talk about it in the book, the parable of the prodigal son, right in the first or second chapter. And um, it is just a beautiful illustration of the gospel of Christ. Give us, give us your best shot of what's coming in the future and how we can be hopeful. Cause I know a lot of things right now are uh, to some people, discouraging it's it's uh a culture of fear um the way society is going and just things look chaotic um is it going to get better is it going to get worse and what's our hope at the end of the the tunnel there um okay so you know in order to put this into context sometimes it's helpful to return to the genesis 6 narrative in order to explain what I think is going to unfold on earth at the end of the age. So we, we mentioned the Genesis, the Genesis six narr narrative, uh, which is expounded in the book of Enoch, enlarged upon in the book of Enoch. That's where the original source of the story comes from, or one of the original sources. And the book of Enoch talks about the watchers who lusted after the daughters of men. We talked about the physical implications of lust. You you've got to have the equipment. You've got to have a physical impulses to lust. Um, and they, they, had, they had a plan. This, as I said, this was not an unorganized situation, scenario that unfolded. Rather, it was a strategy, the unfolding of a strategy. So they were driven by lust, yes. But they also desired to procreate. They wanted to create their own family. They wanted offspring. Men had wives. They were beautiful. So there's a, the, the first impulse is lust, but then men also were able to create little versions of themselves, miniatures of themselves in the form of offspring. They were able to procreate, and the watchers desired to procreate. And the third thing I think that the, the third motivation of what the watchers did, the transgression of the watchers, was that they coveted man's dominion of planet Earth. And so they formulated a plan to, to get all three of these things, to take wives from among the daughters of men, copulate with them because they lusted after them, to, through this union, procreate offspring, and then through their offspring, take dominion of the earth. Now, this is a little technical. When the watchers descended to the earth on Mount Hermon, they bound themselves, they bound themselves by an oath of mutual imprecations. In other words, we're all in this together. We are all going to pay the price for this transgression should there be a price to be paid. So they bound themselves by mutual imprecations and then they descended into the plains. And they began to choose wives from the daughters of men. Now, I do not believe that this means that they were taking these women and throwing them over their shoulders and raping them. That's not what we're being, that's not what's being conveyed through the narrative. Rather, they're choosing the women that they would like to wed. And then I think we can intimate that a transaction was made because we see the results of the transaction. We see the evidence of the transaction. In fact, the book of Enoch tells us what the transaction was. Uh, 
ambiguously. The watchers, what they wanted to accomplish was they wanted to do the things I mentioned, but they wanted to do it in a way that was legal, that would give them legal cover because they're not stupid. They know that these armies of heaven who, by the way, who enforce our dominion on earth. And I didn't really get around to, I just realized I really didn't answer your, your first question about the, the seal and the king sending a regent to a different land. I didn't, I didn't really get around to that. But, but the watchers, the watchers wanted to have legal cover for what they were about to do. So they made a deal with the legal regents of earth the offspring of Adam, probably in this case, more specifically, the offspring of Cain. So the deal was, here's the women we would like to wed. Their fathers will give them their hands in marriage. The fathers will give us, speaking from the perspective of the watchers, the fathers will give us their daughter's hands in marriage. Remember, that was a patriarchal society. Uh, the daughters didn't choose who they wanted to marry. The fathers chose who those daughters yeah. would marry. And there was an, indo- there was a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, shoot. A, a, a dowry. A dowry. A dowry yeah. associated with marriages. There was always a transaction associated with marriages. So in this case, the watchers, these extraterrestrial interlopers who did not have authority on earth are interacting with the ones who did have authority on earth, the sons and the sons of Adam. Yeah. Again, probably specifically the sons of Cain who were the offspring of Adam, just like the line of Seth. So the deal is, here's the women we want to wed. You give us their hands legally, a legal transaction in marriage with all of the pomp and circumstance that would have been involved, a covenant, the covenant of marriage, and in, and in exchange, we will give you technology. And we know that this is the case because the Book of Enoch specifically says that the Watchers gave men, they taught them the knowledge they were striving to learn. And that knowledge manifested in all kinds of, uh, uh, in technology. It manifested in technology, the making of implements of war and so forth, pharmacia and all kinds of technology. So scientific knowledge, let's say. And so the watchers were wed to the the daughters of these individuals and these and the men were taught scientific knowledge that was the transaction I believe that these women wanted nothing would th- th- these these were this proposition for them was beyond anything they could have ever imagined here the sons of god who are superior to human males even to the offspring of adam in the antediluvian world. These would have been exceedingly handsome looking young men, the the sons of God, the watchers. They would not have been grotesque. They would have not have been reptilian. They would have been exceedingly handsome young men because they're in the family of God. They're siblings. They would have been bearing the image of God in my estimation. And so these women would have been delighted to marry these gods among men, the gods walking among men. They're going to be the wives of the gods. So I think they were more than willing to participate in this transaction. So the watchers, and by the way, there were 200, according to the Book of Enoch, there were 200 watchers in all. They had sexual intercourse. They copulated with these women. And the women conceived and gave birth to giants. Now, whether they gave birth to giant babies or the babies had uh, grew at an exponential rate. So they were normal sized. And this is what I think they were normal sized babies, but just like people with gigantism today, they would have had an accelerated growth, which is what I think happened. These offspring, the hybrid offspring of, of the gods and human women of this, of the elder race and the human race grew to exceptional, to extraordinary size. They were giants. Now, Why were they giants? I think that they were giants because in order for the watchers to attain their ultimate goal, which was dominion of the earth, they had to produce children who were human enough, sons who were human enough to inherit the birthright of Adam, 
Remember, we said that the birthright of Adam is not merited, but inherited through his genome. So they would, ha- they would have been human enough to inherit the birthright of Adam. But also, because they were not entirely human, they would have had the extraordinary capabilities of their fathers. And this exceptional size, the fact that they were giants, would have allowed them to easily dominate the kingdoms of man, dominate mankind, usurp the thrones of the offspring of Adam. So you can see the advantage in the, in the, in the watchers having hybrid sons who were giants. This gave them a tactical advantage over the rest of mankind, right? So, so what happened effectively in the, in the, in the antediluvian world, in the pre-flood world, the antediluvian age, is that the authority of mankind on planet Earth was usurped by the hybrid offspring of the Watchers. And the Watchers governed the Earth from behind the thrones because they did not have legal authority to govern the Earth, but their hybrid sons did. So they governed the Earth through their proxies, their sons. Now, why is that important for the end of the age? Well, of course, we know the result of this was the flood of Noah. But why is this important? Because I believe that at the end of the age, the dragon and his angels are going to do the same thing. They're going to produce hybrid offspring with the daughters of men who will be human enough to inherit the birthright of Adam and govern the earth for a time. Remember that the beast is authorized by God to govern for a period of time. Why is he authorized? Because he is legally able to appropriate the birthright of Adam, especially considering that he's going to arise in in the context of a post-human paradigm. In other words, mankind is going to be transitioning out of Adam and thereby losing the authority and the dominion associated with being the sons and daughters of Adam, associated with their genome. Are you guys tracking with me? Yes. Yeah. It's all very complicated. Yep. No, it's great. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I'm not entirely sure I'm making sense. So, oh, yeah. so at the end of the age, no, we're following. going to have a, another usurpation of Adam's dominion. Now, what's the good news? Now, of course, I'm cutting out a whole lot of details here. We can yeah. back up and talk about it. what's the good news. Let's get to the good news so we don't finish this talk without, <laughs> without giving people hope. Well, yeah, yeah. the hope, remember, let's, let's envision the deed of the earth being given to man to, to Adam. So envision a scroll, a deed being handed to Adam mm-hmm. at the beginning because he was created to govern the earth. He and his offspring, here's the deed. So imagine this scroll that the father, that, that the king of heaven is handing his new regent, the title deed of the earth. And, and it's, it's for Adam and his offspring to govern the earth. Why do they need to have the title deed of earth? We, we sort of circumvented this and we, we can back up and get back to it. Your original question about, you know, the regent and, and why it's necessary to, be, to bear the seal of the king and how the seal of the king is the image of God in which we're made. Because in order for any governor to rule effectively, he needs to have the authority of the king who sent him. So if a vice regent, all right, let's back up and do this real quick and then we'll end on the good news, right? If I'm a vice regent, if I'm a king, okay, and you, Josh, are my vice regent, and I'm going to send you to a distant part of my kingdom to rule over a people who are living on the borders of my kingdom, you have to, you have to carry with you a token of my authority that confirms your appointment, but it represents my authority. So that when you get to that far off territory, you can present a token of your authority. And so that the people know that it's not your authority, but rather mine, that I have invested you with my authority to govern in that land. And what does that mean? That means that if they reject your rule, then they are effectively rejecting my rule. If they cross you, then they're crossing me. So if they attempt to throw you out of the territory, 
then they will have the understanding that my armies will be on their way to enforce your your authority and install you in the position to which you were appointed, right? The armies of the kingdom, of my kingdom, are going to enforce your authority. If it were not so, then your, your rule would be entirely ineffectual. You have to have teeth. You have to have the armies of the kingdom enforcing your authority, backing up your governance, or the people will simply rebel. So what? who enforces man's authority on earth? The armies of the kingdom. Remember, Lord of armies. His armies enforce our authority. So the kingdom of heaven enforces the authority of mankind. Why, why does this make, this doesn't make any sense, by the way, if there aren't other powers, if there aren't other entities that could vie for dominion of the earth, simply push us aside and come and take it by force. So the kingdom of heaven, and we're talking about kinetically, not, not spiritually, kinetically enforces right, right. our authority. In other words, they yeah. do it by force of arms. Mm-hmm. They enforce the authority of mankind on planet Earth, whether we realize it or not. Mm-hmm. It's their job. And they will do so as long as there are the sons and daughters of Adam around <laughs> to enforce Fight their authority. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I say we're moving into a post-human paradigm, I'm talking about a paradigm where there will not be many sons and daughters of Adam left on planet Earth. Mankind will have collectively transitioned into a post-human, a non-human condition, and thereby lost the birthright of Adam in the process. And, And I reference this as selling our birthright for a bowl of stew because we're going to be, and we are being enticed, enticed into a post-human condition. Even now, we're being enticed to, eat, to direct our evolution, to, uh, to consciously evolve into something that is non-human. And that would be through the amalgamation of, of, of biology and technology, but also in the miscegenation of the human species with non-human species, animals or extraterrestrials or something of that nature. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if we transition out of Adam through technology, which we can talk about in the, the transhumanism, if we transition out of Adam, then we lose the authority and the birthright to govern the earth. That's a key component in what's unfolding at the end of the age. So let's fast forward to the good news in case we don't get to it. I, I hate when we don't get to the good news in these interviews because I don't like to leave people in a, in a despairing state sure. of mind. Yeah, because you're describing a scary place right yeah, now. We're describing a post-human man. Earth in the future, a post-human planet Earth that's being governed by the hybrid offspring of the dragon and his angels, and who are preparing to make war with God at Armageddon, with the Son of God. That's what we're talking about. And who have ostracized and then persecuted and are now trying to absolutely and finally eliminate not only Christians, but all homegrown human beings in order to fully retain this dominion of the earth. Legally, by the way, remember, he's given, he's authorized to rule the beast because he does it legally, just like the Watchers did with their offspring Mm, in Genesis 6. So let's fast forward to the end of this scene, and we, we encounter John, who has a vision. And in this vision, he's in heaven, and he sees the Father sitting on the throne, and there's a scroll in the right hand of the Father. There's a scroll. Okay, what is that scroll? I submit to you, it is the deed of the earth, the birthright of Adam. In the hand, right hand of the Father, and the angel proclaims in a loud voice, who is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals and break its seals? Who is worthy, the angel proclaims. And you can imagine in John's vision, the angel is looking around. Who can take the scroll from the hand of the Father and break its seals? And it says that no one in heaven or on earth was found worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. In other words, open the scroll. Nobody 
was found worthy. And then there's this intriguing scene that I could never understand as a youth. John begins to weep bitterly over this scroll. And I could never understand, why is John weeping over this scroll? He's not just, he's not just emotionally distraught. He is weeping bitterly. Imagine him standing there crying like a baby over this scroll that's in the right hand of the Father. Why? What is eliciting this, this extreme emotion? Because that scroll represents the deed of the earth. And there are no more human beings left on earth to appropriate the birthright of Adam and take dominion of the earth from the beast and the hybrid kings. But here's the good news. Even if there are no more human beings left on planet earth, there is still a son of man seated at the right hand of the father. There is still yeah. a son of Adam. Come on. And he is a son of Adam. Yep. And what happens? That's what John sees is, well, let me back up. So John is, is weeping bitterly over the scroll. And then the, the angel says to him, John, don't worry. He said, that the, and I forget, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase, and I should know it by now. He says that the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, has prevailed. He is worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. He said to John, do not weep. The Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He is worthy to take the scrolls and break its seals. He is the root and the offspring of Jesse. That means he preexisted Jesse the father of David, but he also came through the family line and was born a descendant of David. He has the authority, not only of his father David, but of Adam to govern the earth. And when John looked up, he saw at the right hand of the father, a lamb as if it had been slain. And he took the scroll from the father's hand and he began to break open the seals and which and every time he broke a seal it was judgment calamity on the empire of the beast what is jesus doing he is appropriating the birthright of adam as a son of adam and he is worthy to open that scroll and he's breaking the seals and he is bringing calamity on the empire of the beast Ooh, and what happens now. at the end oh. of the story not the very end but near the end of the story the beast and his, I believe, inhuman armies with all the technology that's available at this time, which artificial intelligence, all kinds Other. of advanced aerospace vehicles, everything, Neuralinks. everything, <laughs> Neuralinks, everything that's available to the beast and his armies and the apostate sons of God yeah. who, are, who, are, who are also in play here. They're gathered together not to do battle with Israel, because that's not what ultimately happens. They do battle with the Son of God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is returning to the earth with the armies of heaven in train to do battle with the Antichrist, with the beast and vanquish him and regain dominion of the earth for us, the offspring of Adam. Jesus is, as my good friend, the late Russ Dizdar used to say, the hero of humanity. He is the hero of humanity. He rescues mankind. He vanquishes the beast and he restores dominion of the earth to the sons and daughters of Adam, of whom he is preeminent. That is the end of this scenario. So it's not doom and gloom. It's victory. It's, 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 it's the Son of God vanquishing his enemies and establishing his kingdom and ruling and reigning as the second Adam. See, the first Adam screwed it up. But the second Adam is going to do what the first Adam could not and should have done but could not. He's going to rule the earth 
in perfect submission to the will of his father. He is going to govern as a perfect son. And those who believe in him will rule and reign with him. So that's the end of the story. And what the dragon is going to attempt to do is usurp dominion of the earth. That's why we're being beguiled into post-humanism. That's why. Because we're being enticed to sell our birthright, just like Esau, for a bowl of stew. And we're, do, we're, we're being enticed with the very same lie that he used to entice Eve. You shall be like the gods. Well, who were, it's not you shall be like God. It's you shall be like the gods. Who are the gods? Those heavenly beings that mankind was created to be just a little bit lower than them. The elder race, the gods. You shall be like the gods. And indeed, mankind will be endeavoring to be like the gods who will be walking among them at this point, at the end of the age, and will have the technology to fundamentally alter human biology forever. Oh. That's where this is headed. And it's headed there like a freight train. Yeah, it is. And that's why I term the coin, I'm, I'm sorry, Reverse that. <laughs> That's why I coined the term apotheotheism in reference to the last religion. Apotheo meaning, apotheo being derived from the word apotheosis. It's the deification of mankind, but it's not just apotheosis. It's also theism, the recognition of the gods. So it's mankind becoming like the gods. Apotheotheism. That is the religion of the future because the gods are going to show up at some point in the future. I call him Apollo, the man of sin. Apollo and his consort, the Antichrist and his consort will show up at some point to deliver mankind from an impending threat. And I think that that impending threat is an alien threat. And that can be a conversation for another day. Alien threat slash perhaps an impending natural disaster. So... So this is the scenario that's unfolding at the end of the age. And people can say, you're crazy. Okay, I'm crazy. But crazy or not, we are headed for a post-human paradigm on planet Earth. And there is no arguing that point. That is a done deal with the, the World Economic Forum's uh, transhumanist prophet Yuval Noah Harari is going around saying that in 100 to 200 years from now, there will be no more human beings left on planet Earth. And you know what? He's right. And guess what? In 100 to 200 years from now, we will be at the end of the age of Pisces, entering the age of Aquarius, just like Jesus said, the end of the age. Which age? His age. What was his symbol? A fish. What is the symbol of Pisces? A fish. We are in the age of Christ. And at the end of this age, that is when these things will be consummated. But a little bit shorter than the end of the than the very end of the age age, because Jesus says, unless those days were shortened. There would be no flesh alive, or alternatively, no, no flesh would be saved, or alternatively, no flesh would be able to be saved, because what is the one condition, the one stipulation for salvation through the cross of Christ? There's only one stipulation. You can be the greatest murderer that the earth has ever seen, rapist, pedophile. You can be Adolf Hitler times a hundred and still repent and turn your life and repent and receive salvation through the cross of Christ. But there's one stipulation. You must be human. You must be a son or daughter of Adam because the Son of God became a man to redeem mankind. That's why he's called our kinsman redeemer. And so... 
if you forfeit your humanity, if you transition, that's what the word transhumanism means, by the way, it's a, tr it's a transitional term. If you transition from human to post-human, not only do you forfeit your birthright, the birthright of Adam, dominion of the earth, you also forfeit your candidacy for salvation in the cross of Christ. It is calamitous. Beyond description, beyond expression, it is calamitous for human beings, and this may sound like science fiction today, but call me back in 20 years. It is calamitous for mankind to transition out of Adam and into a post-human condition. Nothing could be worse for planet Earth and the inhabitants thereof. Nothing. Because when we lose our birthright, somebody else is going to gain it. The hybrid offspring of the dragon. Genesis 6, 2.0. Just as we're becoming non-human, they're becoming human enough to appropriate the birthright of Adam and legally usurp dominion of mankind on planet, on planet Earth. That's why the subtitle of my book is The Coming Post- human apocalypse and the usurpation, which means the hijacking of Adam's birthright. On, uh, no, what's the rest of that? And the usurpation of Adam's dominion on planet Earth. So, so that's the scenario I see playing out. Now, I could be wrong in some of the details, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but that is how it is going to unfold as I see it. And, uh, and I make a very, I think I make a very strong case in my book which has many footnotes and biblical references to back up the things that I'm saying. And I'm, I haven't gone through those references because I'm just trying to tell you the story um, within this short period of time. Yeah, that's why the audience well, needs certainly... to go and buy your book and buy five copies of them and distribute them amongst their family and friends, right? Uh, and, and also, Tim, if you're, if you're charismatic, this would be the time that you would take up an offering. <laughs> I have no desire to take up an offering. <laughs> I'm doing fine. I, yeah, yeah, I love it. But it's not that far fetched, and it's an easy connection to the mark of the beast idea. Everybody's been saying for the last sixty years it was a microchip. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, a, it's an easy connection to technology. Yeah, yeah. Idea. So that that's probably a good place to stop. I mean, you know, I can come back on at a later date. And we can talk about transhumanism and aliens, and you know, the details of what all of this is going to look like. But I think we put a nice bow on it. Yes, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And, and we'd love that. We haven't even gotten aliens isn't even in the scope of what we've discussed on this podcast yet. So that day is coming. We've, we'll hint, sure we've hinted at it. Out yeah, to you. But yeah, but we'll definitely reach out to you for that topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man, yeah, we, we would definitely. Well, love it's to a good thing we didn't talk about it then. But you do encounter that scenario in my book. And uh, it is, uh, you know, it's it's going to be surprisingly relevant. It is surprisingly relevant, whether people know it or not. But um, but anyway, hopefully I've been able to articulate you know the uh, a synopsis of, of 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 my book and of and of how i th see things playing out and um yeah and uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a it was a pleasure to to do so on your program man what an incredible show we we're so glad he was able to join us that is such a fun topic and we're looking forward, hopefully, to having him on again in the future to talk more about aliens and some things that we didn't get to in this episode. In the meantime, though, you can go get his book, Birthright. You can go watch him on YouTube. He's got a lecture series on Birthright, and he's got several other episodes with guests where they discuss similar topics. You can go check out his documentary, True Legends. You can find all that information and more on his website, timothyalberino.com. So go check him out. And if you haven't subscribed to Behind the Curtain, Mysteries of the Past and Present, make sure you do that on whatever platform you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, Google, YouTube. And uh, make sure you follow us on social media like Instagram or Twitter or TikTok. That's right. We went and got a TikTok. So make sure you follow us on social media so that you can keep up with all the latest updates. So you can send us your questions and comments. We love hearing from our listeners. And we love answering questions. So go ahead and reach out to us. Follow us on social media. You don't want to miss our next episode where we have another guest coming on to wrap up our series on Genesis. 
He's going to explain the historical nature of the Genesis 11 story, the Tower of Babel and Nimrod, and what connection the biblical story has to real historical data that, that archaeologists have and geologists and historians have. It's going to be great. Don't miss it. See you then.